Because even if you went to Austria and you presented yourself as a refugee, they could still send you back. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. We continue Drea Hahn's story with her family's escape to Austria and the realities of being a refugee. In 1986, under the pretext of a ski trip to Yugoslavia, Drea's family escaped to Austria. We hear about the sadness of being unable to tell anyone they were leaving and how her relatives were summoned to the police station to be detained for questioning. Once in Austria, there was no certainty that Drea's family wouldn't be handed back to Czechoslovak authorities as Austria was neutral and their government was keen to stay on good terms with their neighbours. Drea's family were in Austria for about two years, living in a single room with a shared bathroom. We hear from her about the challenges of life as a child refugee in rural Austria. However, in 1988, permission was granted to emigrate to the US and we hear of their elation at this news. Now, I could really do with your help to continue to track down these unknown stories of the Cold War and ensure that they are preserved. If you can spare it, I'm asking listeners to pledge a small monthly amount per month to help keep us on the air, although larger amounts are welcome too. Plus, you get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a monthly financial supporter, and you bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. But don't take my word for it. This is Mary O'Grady of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Anyone who's interested in... Cold War history should definitely subscribe and support Cold War Conversations. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. So back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Drea Hahn back to our Cold War Conversation. Drea, your your father had become more and more disillusioned with uh life in Czechoslovakia what what was causing that disillusionment well um so my father you know he was very bright he had gone to university now he was born in 1945 so his university days would have been in the 60s um kind of leading up to the Prague Spring so you know he lived through that normalization period afterwards where everything just i mean clamped down. If you thought things were bad before, they were much worse afterwards. Um, So, but he still, you know, he still was thinking like, okay, you know what, I'll just work hard. I'll eventually get promotion. The situation in the country is going to get better. Um, That kind of thing. Um, Now, he didn't agree with the Communist Party. Um, He refused to join Apparently, this was something that was brought up to him a lot, especially since his mother was a true believer. Um, you know, and friends around him joined just to improve his jobs, job prospects. But um, but he, he didn't want to do that. And he gradually really came to hate it. Um, you know, my mother said that he just gradually kind of became more and more disillusioned and more and more unhappy Um, And he didn't really talk to my mom much about all of this because it would affect her. She had a very good job. She was considered trustworthy. She was working in this kind of quasi government bureaucracy situation. Um, So, you know, if he openly talked to her about, you know, what he was thinking and it, it might affect her, what if she said something to her at work or to her friends, you know, it would cause a problem. And anybody who is Czech would know the word uh, nepsiem nostia, which literally translates as unpleasantries. Um, And, you know, if you did something um, and the government got wind of it, they could find a way to make your life and the lives of your friends and family unpleasant. Um, And that's where we kind of also get into nuances where it wasn't where you said something and everyone you knew got hauled off to jail 
but your life could be made unpleasant. Um, your children could get denied entry to university. You would get denied travel permits. You might not get promotions at work. Th those little things, if you applied for an apartment, because it's not like in the West where you just, you went and you visited an apartment and you said, oh, great, this is beautiful. I can afford it. Let me buy this. No, you had to go through a background check um, to see if the apartment collective would accept you living there. You had to get government permission to live there. So all of these things um, literally could be controlled and it could be it could be affected if you did something that could be considered stepping out of line. One one of the things you said there I found particularly poignant in in so much as you you know your father even at home had to compartmentalize his thoughts from his wife for fear of her accidentally talking about them outside of the home. Yeah, and that wasn't that wasn't abnormal. Um, you also have to understand that my two uncles were in the military. So even within our, our family, you know, it's not, you wouldn't sit around the table and discuss politics. Um, you know, for my grandparents, they had lived through so much. They kind of took the view of don't even bring it up. If you don't bring it up and you don't talk about it, there can't be any problems no matter what happens. Um, you know, if, for example, you know, my father just decided to leave, it was par for the course that everyone in the family would get undergo police interrogation. Now, if he didn't tell you what he was planning, then you could honestly say, I didn't know. So that was kind of the mentality behind things. Yeah, but he really, he started really not, not being a happy person. So a lot of my childhood memories of him are, are not happy. Um, there was a man who got angry very quickly. There was a man that drank a lot. Um, there, but there also at the same time, a man who was very, very keen on education, on schooling, um, you know, allowing me to watch television was, <laughs> was a little bit of a fight in our household because he was not okay with me sitting in front of a tube for, for hours on end, um, which as a little kid, I love to do. Um, and my, my mom said that later on, she found out that he'd actually thought about leaving the country before he met her, but then he got a good job, um, probably because his mother, who was a party member, helped a little bit. Um, you know, he thought the situation in Czech would improve. Um, but he actually did have friends that had escaped, you know, and he also knew that if you had a wife and, and a child, you would get more opportunities for things like travel. Because, you know, they, the thought process was the more family you had in check, the lower you were of a flight risk because you wouldn't want to uproot your wife and your children and everything like that. Um, so it, and that's one of the oddball, strange things, too, is um, when you're talking to a lot of your guests, you know, um, there is very much a difference between the people that escaped as individuals and the people that escaped as families and and the risks and the trade offs that they had to make. Yeah. But as you say, he had a, a good job because it, the, his company was involved in building projects abroad, weren't they? <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and this was surprising to me, but yes, um, Czechoslovakia was heavily involved in building projects happening in Africa, um, and his company, Mozambique specifically. Um, so what they would do is, you know, he was a trained engineer, so he, he was the person who designed the plans for building factories, for building heavy-duty kind of industry and machinery and things like that. Um, so his company would send people to Mozambique for six month projects. And, you know, it's like, you know, any company, you know, project comes up, everybody applies for it. And then you wait and see who the company chooses. Well, so his plan was to kind of build trust within the company, then get, get on that project to Mozambique. And when he was there to somehow figure out how to get me and my mother out, but somebody else got the job. And he was getting, you know, passed over for promotion after promotion um, because he was viewed as an untrusty person 
And, you know, the idea of like, well, just join the party, just join the party, like that kept constantly kind of coming up professionally. Um, I'm sure he was getting it from his my grandmother as well. You know, just just do it. Why don't you want to help build this new country and contribute to your nation and things like that? Um, so it, it was a lot of stress. Um, but yeah, he was getting passed over. And at this time also, there the Communist Party had set up these schools. So he'd had a university education and Charles University had very high standards. Um, It's not a school that's easy to get into. Um, But they set up this thing where, you know, the workers at his company, for three years, they would get sent to this Communist Party school, sometimes as night school, sometimes they would get leave for a year to go and study. But, um, you know, three years at that school became equivalent to a university degree. And then these people were passing him for promotions and things like that. So that kind of, that added a lot to that feeling of hopelessness and being trapped and just, just generally kind of feeling like you didn't have a future there. So was it around the fact that he wasn't a member of the communist party that he was being overlooked or, or were there people sort of saying that he's a, a little bit ideologically suspect anyway? Um, I I feel like it was it was both. Um, You know, I'm hoping to ask him all of these questions soon. Um, But, yeah, it it really. I don't know. I I, I just don't know. Um, And my mother also, you know, what she knows is very limited because. There's even a lot more that is about to happen that he's just not going to be sharing with her. And that's a lot of that is for her own safety. you know, another project later came on and um, this time it was a one year project and whoever was chosen for this job would be able to take their family with them. So that's another misconception I, I kind of want to to dispel a little bit because there were these strange like agreements or set up or instances where Czech people would be able to, let's say, there was a random fluke and 50 students from Charles University might be sent to study in New York for a year. It never happened before. It never happened again. It just randomly happened that year. So things like that would, would be happening. Um, you know, I, I mean, you were living in this very strange and sometimes absurd world. Yeah. 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 And in, in, East or the former East Germany, you can get hold of your Stasi file post the fall of communism. Could you get hold of your STB file in Czechoslovakia? Um, you know what? I actually, on my next trip to to Czech, which will hopefully happen soon because um, we're finally all getting vaccinated, <laughs> especially here in New Jersey. So um, I I am actually going to be doing that um, because this the podcast has prompted me to start looking into my family history. Um, and I do know that we do have police files there because um, my parents were sentenced to 10-year prison sentences. <laughs> so um, we'll get to that later, but I, I know there's a file somewhere. And I hopefully will be able to go to check on my next trip and, and find it and find out what it says in there. Right. Well, we'll look forward to hearing hearing about <laughs> about that, Drea. We're going to have to have you back again and hear about the contents of the files. Um, so you, your father decides he's he's got to get out, and yeah. he he works out a plan, but obviously he's got to share that with your mother. Well, not quite. Um, so you know, he he had applied again for another work project in Mozambique, he got denied again. And at that point, he just, he just kind of realized like, that's it. And the other part is, is that because his future is limited, mine might be as well, because I am his child and his name is on the documents that I have to present anytime I apply for something. So I think that's another thing people don't realize either, is that if you stepped out of line, there were consequences there for not just you, but also your children. 
And that was access to education, access to jobs, um, access to travel, access to programs. You know, maybe as a teenager, all my friends would go on a brigada to maybe Italy to do something and I would be denied because I have this black mark in my background. So, it, it, yeah, it really, um, it was all encompassing. Um, so, you know, all my mom does know is that at this point, um, he started studying English, the English language. Um, in the evenings, you know, they would have dinner and then he would retreat into the bedroom and he would be listening to Radio Free Europe. Um, you know, on nights, he would be out late at night. She had no idea where he went or what he was doing. Um, sometimes he would be away for the weekends. Didn't tell my mom what he was doing, who he was hanging out with, nothing. Because if anything happened, um, it was for her safety. Because if he left alone and she was left behind, um, she would lose her job. Um, we would lose our apartment. We would probably be ostracized by friends and maybe some distant family because, you know, if you escaped and I was associated with you, the police would come and interrogate me and say, well, what did you know? And then that would go in, in the file. And anytime somebody did a background check on me, they would find, oh, you associated with a bad apple. You know, so a lot of times people really distance themselves um, from from the families. And, um, you know, as far as job prospects, you know, it would be menial things like being a cleaning lady, um, mail surveillance. You would never get a travel permit. Um, you know, opportunities for me as far as education and job would would be non-existent. Um, so that's if my father left on his own. Um, you know, if both of my parents left, basically what happens afterwards is there's police interrogations for everyone you're associated with, and they can happen at any time, um, for the foreseeable future. Um, so, you know, you would have those unpleasantries. Um, for example, we did escape, um, my grandparents, my uncles, a, a lot of our friends were pulled in for police interrogations. Um, my mother, my grandmother had a really bad heart condition. I mean, she had a, the bypass scar and everything. Um, so she only had to be interrogated a little bit. I, I, I really wonder if they were afraid they were going to kill her. Um, but my grandpa, he, for about a year after we left, he was repeatedly interrogated, you know, so you would just, you would get this notice that said, come to this office in Prague at, you know, 1300 hours. Don't be late. And, you know, your address was registered with the local police. So if you didn't show up, they knew where to find you. And if you weren't at home, well, they knew everybody you were associated with and everyone in your family. So then they would go after them and then they would find you. So, um, so you went. Um, but they went, they went through that. Um, my father's mother was also interrogated. Um, but for her, you know, she lived in Moravia, so she could prove that she only saw us about once a month. She was a trusted party member, so they left her alone. And, um, you know, in the end, they couldn't prove that anybody knew anything, so nobody had long-term repercussions. Um, the other thing that happened if you left is that your apartment would be sealed. Um, so literally, a rope and a seal would put on it, and it was a crime for anyone, and you'd break that and go in and retrieve any of your belongings. Um, you know, the context, they were usually just given away to party members or sold off cheaply. And then your apartment was given to somebody else. What were your father's plans as to how you were going to escape from Czechoslovakia? Well, <laughs> so my mom, I've only had a chance to get the details from my mom. And for her, um, she said that, you know, her, her knowledge of plans was even limited because if, for example, they were caught at the border, then even at that stage, the less she knew, the better. Um, so, you know, and, and the other thing is after we escaped, um, 
there was a court hearing in absentia and both my parents were judged as enemies or traitors, which is what they called you if you didn't believe in the socialist dream and you escaped. Um, and they each got a 10 year prison sentence. So if they had been caught, they would have been sent to prison, which was a, apparently 10 years was kind of like the pro forma, just basic, you know, that's just what everyone got. Um, but yeah, so not telling everybody, anybody that you were leaving or planning to leave was really one of the only ways that you could keep anybody safe. Um, you know, my mother wasn't crazy about leaving. Um, but then she kind of looked at, okay, here's what my life will look like if he leaves and I'm left behind. Um, so she decided she's going to, we're going to go with my father. Um, but she had heard about the people who had escaped and, you know, people trying to run across the border in the woods and getting shot. And, you know, I was five or six years old at the time. And she, she basically told my father that, you know, I'm not taking that risk with my child, um, that, you know, she, she would go, but my father had to figure out a safer way than that to get out. Because I, I think at that point he was just ready to put on a backpack, drive to the border and run across. And she, my mom is not the most, most, you know, athletic person to begin with. Um, and also with a small child, I, I think she really didn't want to do that. So, um, my mom said that, you know, he said, okay, I'm going to figure it out. And he went into planning mode and my mom, you know, they just, they, at the same time, they have to keep living their normal lives. So going to work, interacting with all of the people around them, just you literally not giving a hint that anything was wrong or different or, or anything. Um, and she said at this point, she was just going through the motions like a zombie. Um, she, she just couldn't believe this was happening. <laughs> Because she would have been happy, you know, staying. Um, she wasn't very politically involved. She she just, as long as she had a decent job and a good living and a nice future for me, she she would have been okay staying and putting up with everything. Um, so around, you know, 1984, 1986 is, is around when we are. Um, and the government did allow some checks to go to the West for vacation. So... They would basically have this almost travel lottery um, where you had to apply. They did a background check. Um, you had to have enough money, you know, to be able to actually go on this trip. You had to have enough family left behind um, for, you know, quote unquote collateral. So you weren't a flight risk and you applied. And then out of all of the applications that came in, they would weed out the unsuitable ones. And then out of that, they would pick a hundred people and those people would be able to go to the West for vacation. So I think mo a lot of people, um, you know, Italy, France, Germany were kind of the top, top places to go. Um, so we tried to do that. We were denied. Um, a year later, we applied for a trip to Yugoslavia and normally for these Yugoslavia trips, you know, you would kind of do those tour things like I'd done with my grandparents. So you would get, all get on a tour bus and the bus to Yugoslavia would go through Austria. So, it, you know, if you look at a map, um, you can, you know, you look at Czech, you look at Prague and you see getting to the ocean in Yugoslavia and on the Croatian coast, it's a lot easier if you just cut through Austria and, you know, people are on a bus. So, you know, it, it's the doors are going to be sealed to, so that nobody's jumping off of this bus, but it, that's how you did it. Um, so what my father did is um, he said, well, we're going to be taking our own car. So he was hoping that we could drive through Austria. And then once we got across the border into Austria, we could get asylum there. Um, but we got denied that travel permit. Um, apparently it was, it was too risky to allow us to do that. So the only kind of permit we were able to get was to get out of check and then drive all the way around to get to Yugoslavia. So we had to drive all the way around Austria to get to Yugoslavia. Um, at this point, you know, my father gave my mom very strict instructions on 
how to prepare. Um, so acting normal, you can't tell anyone. Um, we knew as soon as we left, the apartment would be sealed and everything in there would be given away or sold. Um, but you can't sell anything in advance because that's suspicious. You don't give, you know, you don't give anything to anyone for safekeeping because that's suspicious. And if they get interrogated by the police and they say something like, oh, well, a week before they disappeared, you know, Yana came over and she gave me all her silverware. You would be in trouble because you knew, but you didn't report this. So you didn't tell anyone. Um, and then basically they packed for a one week vacation. So that's the most information that my mother received. Yugoslavia, even though it was communist, wasn't part of the the Warsaw Pact. So I'm presuming your your father thought that there would be an opportunity to get either to Italy or to uh, Austria from there. Yeah, I, I think um, at this point now the 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 pathways to escape at this point were pretty well known and pretty well established. So I, I think for somebody like my father, who'd been thinking about this for a long time and who, who kind of, I, I guess on those nights and weekends, he was away, he was making contacts. Um, you know, there were certain pathways and ways you knew to do things. And Yugoslavia was a little freer than the other countries. So if you got into Yugoslavia, you had a better chance of being able to get somewhere else. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we packed the car up for one week family vacation um, at the border. We went through that controla process, which I talked talk to you guys about last time. Um, and yeah, my mom says they pulled everything out of the car. They searched the entire car. Um, I mean, I remind, recall stories about, you know, people who had the seats slashed and the door leather slashed just to make sure there weren't things stuck in there. Um, all their luggage was pulled into her room. You know, they searched through everything. Um, at this point, you know, my mom said that she was standing behind the, beside the car and she was, she was just a complete wreck, nervous wreck. Um, so my father did all the talking and, um, she said our chances were about 70, 30 of being able to cross the border. And, you know, she was afraid because if at that point they think that you're escaping and they send you back, you go to prison. You attempted to escape, you go to prison. You know, there's no ambiguity. There's no way to talk yourself out of it. There's just, it's so plain, like that it is what it is. You know, at that point, you kind of, there's no point of return. Um, but, but we did, we, we were able to get across the border. Um, we went to our designated resort. So apparently we did go to Yugoslavia. We had a wonderful three days of a family vacation and then um, my father left for about four days and my mom and I stayed at the resort and she's not sure where he went, what, what he did, uh, anything like that. Um, as a kid, I remember tasting coconut for the first time. So to me, that was the highlight. Um, but yeah, um, so he left and when he came back, he, you know, we packed up the car and apparently what we did is we went to the embassy in Yugoslavia and my mom thinks it was the one in um, Split because we were kind of in that area. Um, but um, my father told them that we were having car trouble and that, you know, the, with the state of our car, we would never make it back home going the long way around. And could we please have travel permits to go directly through Austria back into Czechoslovakia? And somehow that was approved. So we crossed um, into Austria. We drove straight to Vienna. He went to the embassy and he asked for asylum. And after that, we were sent to the, uh, the Treiskirchen refugee camp that's in Austria. And that's, that was kind of the big refugee processing point that Austria had set up. And it was a place they processed refugees after World War II. Hungarian refugees in the 50s were there. Um, it was the main center for any of the Eastern Bloc refugees. And I mean, it's still operating. They, the Syrian refugees that came into Austria were processed there. Um, and we were in cells. 
and my parents had to go through separate interrogations. So they weren't able to talk to each other. Um, you know, basically to be granted asylum, you had to prove that you were being politically persecuted in where whatever country you were coming from. And, you know, during these interviews, my mom said she, she was absolutely shocked at how much information they knew about her, about our family, about her job. Um, and she said that, you know, apparently they had ways to verify everything that you were telling them. Um, because, you know, again, the, the Western countries also had to be careful not to just have anybody willy nilly coming in and settling in the country. Um, and you've interviewed <laughs> quite a few spies, so you probably know uh, much better than uh, than me what the risk was of, of something like that. Um, but that's what happened. Could I just ask you a couple of questions on on that? When, at which point did you know that this was going to be a very strange holiday and that you weren't going to be going home? Um, you know what? I, I had felt the tension mounting and I, I just remember getting car sick a lot. Um, getting, yeah, throwing up a lot in the backseat, just the tension and the anxiety. Um, so I knew something was happening. Um, and I, I think for me, it sunk in that once we weren't in a resort and once all of a sudden we're in this place and our car is gone, we have our three suitcases and we're in this big place and we're in a cell and you get locked in at night. There's bunk beds, which I, there's dirty mattresses. I don't, I don't even know if we had pillows or blankets, but I remember a lot of metal furniture, um, a lot of linoleum. Um, getting locked in, um, you know, and, and just that feeling of everybody is there waiting and anxiety. Um, you know, and during the day, you'd see all of them, the men in the hallways, and they made um, chess boards out of bottle caps and, and cardboard, you know, just just waiting. So did, did your parents sit down with you and and say, you know what? We're not going back and you're not going to see your grandparents again. Uh, no, I, I didn't realize that until um, after after the processing center, we were sent to a town, um, Alt den Mark. And, you know, what, what, what the Austrians had set up is if you owned an inn or hotel or something, the government would help you financially to set that up into a refugee center. So we went into one of those and my parents said, okay, well, this is where we live now. You're not, grandma and grandpa live far away. You're going to be going to school. And, you know, you're, you're also raised as a little kid. You're, you're not raised to ask questions. You, you do as you're told and you keep quiet. And I also knew that feeling of, you know, my parents are very anxious and, my father's a little on the volatile side. You know, that had been my experience for years and years. So asking my father anything was out of the question. Um, and my mother was, you know, still kind of reeling from, from the shock of everything. Um, you know, so I knew like, okay, you know what, just be quiet and do as I'm told. Um, but yeah, I, I miss my grandparents. I cried a lot. Um, but, you know, I, there were other children in, in immigrant families in our little refugee compound place. Um, I went to the local Austrian school. Um, so after Czech, my first language is German. When I learned to write, it was, you know, the old fashioned German cursive. Um, but yeah, but um, life, refugee life in Austria wasn't, wasn't fantastic. Um, it was better than where we had come from, but it was still, you know, you're still living in limbo. It's not like you got to, you know, I think a lot of times people also think, you know, another misconception is, you know, you have a whole life, you got across the border and then it's a fairy tale and you're settled and everything is wonderful. And, you know, for a lot of families, that wasn't the case either. It was just, okay, we finished that stage. We can breathe a little bit better now. Okay. Now what's next? So how how are your mother and father supporting them and you at this point? 
Um, well, you know what? We, um, we, we, the Austrian government obviously helped refugees. Um, but when you went to these refugee centers, you had a job. So my mother, she actually worked in that, the cafeteria there. And my dad did menial work, um, you know, building, fixing houses, painting homes, that kind of thing. Um, and while all that is going on, I'm going to the local school and, you know, the Austrians, they, they kind of considered all of us, uh, you know, uneducated, dirty, we're bumpkins. I got bullied at school a lot. Um, and, you know, we kind of just stuck to our little, our little compound. You know, my mother, she wanted to stay in Austria because by this point, you know, we were, we were getting real news about what the situation is like in Czechoslovakia. So, and, and there was that knowledge and that feeling of, okay, the, the situation there cannot last. It will not last. Um, so even at that point, I think this was like 1986, 1987, we knew that eventually this is all going to fall apart. Um, so the, the thing was that, you know, eventually the borders are going to open and the place that we were was literally only four hours away from my family. My, my mother said, you know, what, we're just going to stay in Austria. And then when the borders fall down, it, you know, at least we'll be near family. I just want to ask you about the, the schooling. When you, when you say you were bullied at school, did the refugee children sort of form themselves into into groups and sort of were one side of the playground and the, the local kids were the other side of the playground? Um, you know what? I, I think I was the only... Now, Alpenmarkt was a rather small town, so it was kind of like a village. Um, and I was the only refugee girl in my classroom. So your grade would be your classroom. Um, I had friends in the grades above and the grades below, but for the most part during the day, I was on my own and a lot, a lot, some kids were kind, but it was, I never made friends. Um, but it was, you know, you go up to the chalkboard and the teacher isn't sure if you know how to read and you know, you, you're walking up to the chalkboard and the kids stick out their legs. So they trip you and we were poor. I mean, you're living on charity, so your clothes weren't great. <laughs> you know, everything you were using was pretty much donated. Um, so it was that, that kind of life. Um, the teachers were harsh. I mean, I remember getting smacked with a ruler across my fingers. You know, you'd have to put your fingers on the, uh, on the desk and then you whap. Um, and then I would go home and I would get in trouble at home for getting in trouble at school. So, <laughs> you know, because if I got punished at school, obviously I must have done something. So it, it was, it was kind of like that. Um, recess, you would go home for lunch. So there wasn't really a playground aspect to it. You would go home for lunch and then you'd come back in the afternoon. Um, and after school, all of us refugee kids would walk from school. Um, we would walk home together because that's what our parents told us to do, you know, especially, um, you know, the older kids had to kind of help the little kids. So we would all kind of travel home as a pack. A question I wanted to ask you about the crossing of the border into Austria. Can you remember, did your parents react or, or celebrate as soon as they knew they were in Austria? Do you remember that moment? Um, there, was, there was a feeling of relief. But until you actually got to the embassy and were accepted as a refugee... You know, you didn't fully kind of think like, OK, I made it. Because even if you went to Austria and you presented yourself as a refugee, they could still send you back. Yeah, because I guess the, the big difference here, and this might be that pe what people don't necessarily recognize, is if you were an East German and you got to Austria, then West Germany would automatically offer you asylum. Whereas if you were Czech and got to Austria, you had to prove yourself as being a genuine refugee. There wasn't an automatic asylum process. Yeah, no. Um, and, you know, and, and the other thing is you, th you think about this um, because, you know, Austria had to also maintain diplomatic relations. So that is the thing. Western countries were trying not to do things to endanger their relationship with 
the Soviet countries because, you know, things were tense there as well. So you have to tread very carefully, um, very lightly. And um, yeah, for, for any Czechs that wanted to get refugees, you had to prove that you were being persecuted. So how do you how do you do that? Because there's there's no piece of paper that you have from the Czechoslovak Soviet Republic that says, yes, we're not allowing these people to do this and this and this and this because of this and this and this. There's no such thing. Um, so, you know, you would give them all this information and they would have to verify it. And again, my you know, I, like I said before, my mother was shocked at how much information about her they had. Um, and, and somehow these refugee processing centers were able to communicate with, you know, the governing bodies in Czechoslovakia and verify all of this information. Yeah, I guess there's an element of Western intelligence vetting anybody who's coming over as well and whether they've obviously got a, you know, they, they've obviously been gathering information about what's going on in Czechoslovakia. But it's interesting you saying the level of detail that they appear to uh, know about your your mother and her, her job. Yeah, and, and my father too, I'm sure. Again, I, I'm hoping to find out more details when, when I speak to him. But um, yeah. I said that, you know, you were probably told that you'd never see your grandparents, but your grandparents are allowed to come and visit. Can you just take us through that? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, again, another misconception and, and a, one of those strange, absurd things that was happening. Um, so the, the government did try to get people back. Now, you know, you've talked to some people before, if they were famous or import, important, you know, getting kidnapped even after you'd gotten out was a realistic danger. But um, for our family, you know, we were kind of, we were nobodies. We were just regular people. Um, but for those situations, um, my grandparents got a permit. Um, and this was about, I would say, you know, about a year or two after we'd escaped um, to come and visit us. They were allowed to visit us for a week. And the purpose of this visit was to persuade us to come back. And the dangling carrot was that if my parents came back, those prison sentences would be lowered to just a year. Now, you'd still lost your apartment. You, you still would never travel again. You, your job prospects were still stinky, but you could come back. Um, and, you know, for my grandparents, you know, they didn't even they, they Apparently, my mom said, you know, they just said, look, we're not trying to persuade you. We don't we don't want you to come back. It's terrible. We just wanted to see you. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how many people came back, but, you know, for a lot of people that had thought of the West as this beautiful, wonderful thing and that once you get out, you're going to be OK to all of a sudden be kind of in this refugee limbo and you're at the bottom of the heap and, and you're trying to rebuild your life. Um, for a lot of people, they, they were very disillusioned too. And they, and they were like, wow, you know, that I left for this. So I, I don't know how many people actually did come back after that. I'd love to find out. Yeah. It'd be interesting to find out because as you say, the life wasn't great for a refugee in Austria and, you were denied um, visas to stay in Austria. So essentially you were stateless at this point. And so there were a number of other countries that you could apply for residency, weren't there? Um, there were, yeah. I mean, one option is you could you could stay in Austria, but then you'd be staying as an illegal immigrant. So not a great future there. Um, yeah, other countries, um, South Africa was of, of all places was one of these countries. Um, and they were looking for educated people. So my father is an engineer, my mother who did economy and, uh, and accounting and HR and things like that. Um, because they had a lot of, um, they were kind of building up the country and my mother didn't want to go. It was too far away. Um, my father applied anyway. Um, so that, that tells you a little bit about the state of their relationship. Um, but we were denied. Um, my mother didn't want to go to Canada. She said it was too cold. Um, so we applied to the U S 
So how this worked is you would apply. And if you were approved, you just got sent where they sent you in the U.S. It, it wasn't like you, you had a map and they gave you a list of places you could go. Um, you got you got sent where they accepted you. So we did have some friends in Austria who got accepted via uh, church programs in Florida. Um, in our case, we got approved to go to Boston and the Red Cross was helping us out. Um, so once you got approved somewhere, you got on this um, on this waiting list and there were flights every three months from Austria to um, I think New York was the processing point in America at that time. And you just you found out about a week before you got a spot. Um, you know, so my mom, my mom just said it was terrible because every three months you were packing everything up and getting ready to leave. And then you would say, oh, you're not on this flight. And that was about, you know, they went through the, we didn't, this wasn't a quick process. We were in Austria for almost two years going through all of this. Um, but yeah, and, and for my mom says, you know, they were kind of thinking they were finally getting on this flight. And then Gorbachev gave some speech. And then on the next flight, everybody got bumped and the Russian refugees got priority. You know, and everybody was just angry about this. <laughs> you know, it was like, wait a minute. Um, but finally, we, we got on a Pan Am flight. We landed in New York in 1988. And um, I remember that. It was my first plane trip. I remember looking out the window. I remember seeing the U.S. coast. I remember seeing the Statue of Liberty. And I remember when the plane landed, it, it just burst into cheers. I mean, everybody was cheering. Congratulations. There was hugging. People were in tears. It was just this unbelievable feeling of elation and relief. Um, and that was, you know, for some people like my family, it took years to kind of get to the end destination. Yeah, that must have been an amazing moment when that plane landed, as you've described it there. Uh, I was eight years old, and I will, I will never forget it. It was one of the strongest memories I have of my childhood. So on, on arriving in the U.S., where, where were you put up? What, what facilities were offered to you? Um, right. So the, the Red Cross set us up um, for three months. They would kind of set us up. Um, we, were, we were in a house. We shared the house with a Polish family. So they had two bedrooms. We had two bedrooms. We shared the bathroom, the kitchen and things. And and I I remember one night, you know, I went to school and this wasn't in a great section of Boston. And I remember me and another German girl, Hannah, I think she was from Eastern Ger Germany. Um, we were the only white, <laughs> white girls in our elementary school. So if, in my child head, you know, we came to America. I go to school. Everyone's black. I'm like, okay, everybody in America is black. Moving on. Um, you know, and I, I just remember being sad that I couldn't, you know, do my hair up in beautiful beads like all of my friends at school. And how how was school? Was it was it were the kids friendlier than in Austria? Yeah, I, it, I mean, we were we were a little bit of a curiosity, um, but everyone was so nice. And, you know, I spoke German. So to switch to English was not difficult at all. Um, you know, the German word for hat is hut. So the German word for house is house. So from, I, I switched over very easily. Um, you know, both my parents got jobs. Um, you know, they eventually divorced. Um, my father went back to Ch the Czech Republic after the revolution and my mom and I stayed in America. You make it sound so straightforward. Um, <laughs> You make me laugh. You made me laugh saying, you know, you knew German, so your transfer to English was was easy. I'm not sure I would say that I'm particularly good at German, even though I've studied <laughs> it um, well, the the other way. But you've probably got a, a better gift for languages than I have. You know what that that is one of the uh, that is one of the wonderful things all of our ref us refugee children ended up with. Um, we um, were forced to learn a lot of languages as kids. Um, and, and I think as Czechs too, because 
think that that's the other thing people don't understand a lot of time is just the the um, the fluidity of identity um, because my grandparents, you know, they grew up under Nazism where, you know, they were in the Sudetenland. So everything was in German government forms. Um, when, you know, the Nazis took over that area, all of the street names, the storefront names, you know, the check has to come down. The German goes up and the German needs to be twice as big as the check. So everybody's learning German. Um, during my mom's time, everybody had to learn Russian whether you wanted to or not, starting at a certain point in school, you started learning Russian. And that that's just the way it was. Um, so growing up, you know, when my grandmother stubbed her toe, she would say Himmel Hergot. Russian words it were infiltrating, you know, my vocabulary as a little kid. My friends were Kamaratke, my little comrades. So, thing, you know, things like that. Do you remember hearing about the Berlin Wall opening? Um, we did. I actually, um, we were living in Boston, sharing the home with the Polish family still. And um, I, I just remember a hubbub and all of us crowded around the television watching what was happening. And there were, there was celebration. I remember the phone just ringing all night. Um, celebrations. There were toast passed around. Everyone was excited um, I think that Sunday we had a little get together, you know, all of us in our little refugee com community and everybody was, just, I mean, just the feeling of excitement, um, and just everyone talking about, you know, what's going to happen. And, and people were just glued to the TVs and the radios. Um, you know, we, we watched the Velvet Revolution on TV. Um, you know, people couldn't, People just couldn't believe it. They were excited. There was a little bit of apprehension about, okay, we're going to have this great event, and then there's going to be another crackdown. Okay, you know what? Let's wait and see um, and, and see how things were, were going to go. And, of course, after that, you know, a lot of people decided whether they were going to stay in the U.S. or whether they were going to go back. Because for, you know, for a family like ours, where we'd arrived in New York in 1988, you know, we, it's it's not like we had a settled permanent residence and an established life. Um, so a, a lot of people ended up going back. Yeah. So you, you wouldn't have been able to contact your family prior to the Velvet Revolution. Um, you know what? I, that was a situation where you, you kind of weren't sure. Um, you really didn't want to make problems for anybody. Um, but I do remember the first time we saw my family after the revolution, my, my grandfather came to Boston to stay with us. I think, I think he came and stayed for a month. So as, as soon as we could, we, we did reconnect the family. And when were you granted U.S. citizenship? Um, I wasn't. I'm still not. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my mother, so my mother did get naturalized, but you know, <laughs> the, the after revolution story of Czech is, is complicated as well. There was a certain point at which, you know, escaping automatically meant you gave up your Czech citizenship. Um, but there was kind of, there was a rule change that said that, you know, for anybody who had had to flee, who wanted to recover their Czech citizenship, you could. So my mother did. Um, and then for a time, she had dual citizenship. And then um, it changed and said, okay, you're not, not allowed to have dual citizenship. You have to choose. Okay, so <laughs> she chose. Um, I've stayed a Czech citizen the whole time, um, mostly out of respect for my grandparents. I, you know, I talked to them a little bit, and they would have been, I, I think, heartbroken if I'd, I'd given that up. Um, and my mom, I think she has dual citizenship now. And I think when I, I'm working on getting my citizenship here in the United States, um, I think I'm going to be doing a dual as well. But um, I, I've not researched too much of the, of the citizenship situation. So my apologies. Um, if there's anyone out there who knows, you know, how all, things all progressed better than I do, please don't hesitate to tell me I'm wrong because I'm very much not clear on everything that happened in the nineties. <laughs> no, Drea, that is an incredible story. 
you shared with us. I really appreciate that. And I'm delighted that, you know, by us getting in contact, that has, you know, given you the opportunity to ask your family about their past and and given you much more detail as to uh, their lives and, and really how you ended up in the United States. Yeah, I, um, I, I will say that you've opened up quite the can of worms um, because after my parents divorced, um, my father went back to, to the Czech Republic. And, you know, I, I think when I was 11 or 12 is the, is the last time I talked to him or heard of him or anything like that. Um, and now I'm 40 this year. And this was the first time that I was able to really sit down, push my mother and force her to tell me exactly everything that had happened. Um, and the reason I don't know a lot about the nineties is, you know, at a certain point she just said, okay, and now, you know, and then you were old enough to remember for yourself and I'm done. I never want to talk about this ever again. So I finally got the story out of her, but during that time, you know, when she was asking, you know, I was asking her about my father. And so she just said, oh, well, you'd have to ask him. And I said, excuse me. Um, so I hadn't heard from him or about him or anything like that. Well, apparently she'd been able to keep in touch with some of his family, you know, like the annual Christmas letter or things like that. Um, but apparently he's alive. Um, family members found him for me on Facebook, um, told him, um, he would like to reconnect. Um, apparently I also have a half sister in the Czech Republic. Um, so yeah, Cold War Conversations is now a part of our family story. Wow. Wow. That, um, I'm just stunned by that and quite moved by, you know, the, the impact this, um, little podcast has um has had on your life hopefully for the for the real positive as well i mean if if anything i will find out about my own past so it, it was absolutely a good thing already drea i'm i'm honored to have you know listened and and recorded your your story here and i'm sure the listeners will really enjoy your your recollections and and the story of how how you ended up in the US your your story is exactly one of the reasons why I started this podcast cuz without this this story would have been completely unknown and you know as you've described you may have never known this level of detail and and found out you know what what your your past was really about yeah um, at, you hit it right on the nose, um, and I'm still finding out more. So we we will see where it takes me. There is extra information such as videos, photos, and links in our episode notes, which will show as a link wherever you are listening to this podcast. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group, where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Mark Labance, Stephen Kovalich, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Ryan Vlaming, Frederick Esposito, Jack Madwed, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.